Theme 4. The Central Islamic Lands As we enter the 21st century, there are over 1 billion Muslims living in all parts of the world. They are citizens of different nations, speak different languages and dress differently. The processes by which they became Muslims were varied and so were the circumstances in which they went their separate ways. Yet, the Islamic community has its root in a more unified past which unfolded roughly 1,400 years ago in the Arabian Peninsula. In this chapter, we are going to read about the rise of Islam and its expansion over a vast territory extending from Egypt to Afghanistan, the core area of Islamic civilization from 600 to 1200. In these centuries, Islamic society exhibited multiple political and cultural patterns. The term Islamic is used here not only in its purely religious sense but also for the overall society and culture historically associated with Islam. In this society, not everything that was happening originated directly from religion, but it took place in a society where Muslims and their faith were recognized as socially dominant. Non-Muslims always formed an integral, if subordinate, part of the society as the Jews in Christendom. Our understanding of the history of the central Islamic lands between 600 and 1200 is based on chronicles or tawarik, which narrate events in order of time, and semi-historical works such as biographies, sira, records of the sayings and the doings of the prophet, hadith, and the commentaries of the Quran, tafsir. The material from which these works were produced was a large collection of eyewitness reports akbar, transmitted over a period of time either orally or on paper. The authenticity of each report, khabar, was tested by a critical method which traced the chain of transmission, isnad, and established the reliability of the narrator. Although the method was not foolproof, Medieval Muslim writers were more careful in selecting their information and understanding the motives of their informants than were their contemporaries in other parts of the world. On controversial issues, they reproduced different versions of the same event as they found in their sources, leaving the task of judgment to their readers. The description of events closer to their own times is more systematic and an analytical and less of a collection of Akbar. Most of the chronicles and semi-historical works are in Arabic, the best being the Tariq of Tarib Tabari, which has been translated into English in 38 volumes. Persian chronicles are few, but they are quite detailed in their treatment of Iran and Central Asia. Christian chronicles written in Syriac are fewer, but they throw interesting light on the history of early Islam. Besides cr chronicles, we have legal texts, geographies, travelogues, and literary works such as stories and poems. Documentary evidence, fragmentary pieces of writing such as official orders or private correspondence is the most valuable for writing histories because it does not consciously refer to events and persons. It comes almost entirely from Greek and Arabic papyri. Good for administrative history and the Geniza records. Some evidence has emerged from archaeological excavations done at desert places, numismatic study of coins and epigraphic study of inscriptions, sources which is of great value for economic history, art history and for establishing names and dates. Proper histories of Islam began to be written in the 19th century by university professors in Germany and the Netherlands. Colonial interests in the Middle East and North Africa encouraged French and British researchers to study Islam as well. Christian priests too paid close attention to the history of Islam and produced some good work, although their interest was mainly to compare Islam with Christianity. These scholars called Orientalists are for their knowledge of Arabic and Persian and critical analysis of original texts. Ignaz Golzaiher was a Hungarian Jew who studied at the Islamic College 
Al Azhar in Cairo and produced path breaking studies in German of Islamic law and theology. 20th century historians of Islam have largely followed the interests and methods of Orientalists. They have widened the scope of Islamic history by including new topics and by using a light discipline such as economics, anthropology, and statistics have refined many aspects of Orientalist studies. The histori historiography of Islam is a good example of how good religion can be studied with modern historical methods by those who may not share the customs and beliefs to the people they are studying. The Rise of Islam in Arabia, Faith, Community and Politics During 612-32, to 32, the Prophet Muhammad preached the worship of a single God, Allah, and the membership of single community of believers, Ummah. This was the origin of Islam. Muhammad was an Arab by language and culture and a merchant by profession. Sixth century Arab culture was largely confined to the Arabian Peninsula and areas of southern Syria and Mesopotamia. The Arabs were divided into tribes, Kabila, each led by a chief who was chosen partly on the basis of his family connections but more for his personal courage, wisdom and generosity, Murawa. Each tribe had its own god or goddesses who was worshipped as an idol, Sanam, in a shrine. Many Arab tribes were nomadic, Bedouins, moving from dry to green areas, oases of the desert, in search of food, mainly dates, and fodder for their camels. Some settled in cities and practiced trade or agriculture. Muhammad's own tribe, Quraysh, lived in Mecca and controlled the main shrine there, a cube-like structure called Kaaba, in which idols were placed. Even tribes outside Mecca considered the Kaaba holy and installed their own idols at their shrine, making annual pilgrimage, Haif, Hajj, to the shrine. Mecca was located on the crossroad of a trade route between Yemen and Syria, which further enhanced the, which further enhanced the city's importance. The Meccan shrine was a sanctuary haram where violence was forbidden and protection given to all visitors. Pilgrimage and commerce gave the nomadic and settled tribes opportunities to communicate with one another and share their beliefs and customs. Although the polytheistic Arabs were vaguely familiar with the notion of a supreme god, Allah under the influence of the Jewish and Christian tribes living in their midst, their attachment to idols and shrines was more immediate and stronger. Around 612, Muhammad declared himself to be the messenger Rasul of God, who had been commanded to preach that Allah alone should be worshipped. The worship involved simple rituals such as daily prayers, salat, and moral principles such as distributing alms and abstaining from theft. Muhammad was to found a community of believers, Ummah, bound by a common set of religious beliefs. The community would bear witness, Shahada, to the existence of the religion before God as well as before members of other religious communities. Muhammad's message particularly appealed to those Meccans who felt deprived to the gains from trade and religion and were looking for a new community identity. Those who accepted the doctrine were called Muslims. They were promised salvation on the Day of Judgment, Qiyamah, and a share of resources of the community while on earth. The Muslims soon faced considerable opposition from affluent Meccans who took offence to the rejection of their deities and found the new religion a threat to the status and prosperity of Mecca. In 622, Muhammad was forced to migrate with his followers to Medina. Muhammad's journey from Mecca was a turning point in the history of Islam with the year of his arrival in Medina marking the beginning of the Muslim calendar. Islamic Calendar The Hijri era was established during the Caliphate of Umar, with the first year falling in 622 CE. A date in the Hijri calendar is followed by the letters AH, 
The Hijri year is a lunar year of 354 days, 12 months, Muharram to Dhul Hijjah, or 29 or 30 days. Each day begins at sunset and each month with the sighting of the crescent moon. The Hijri year is about 11 days shorter than the solar year. Therefore, none of the Islamic religious festivals, including the Ramazan fast, Eid and Hajj, corresponds in any way to seasons. There is no easy way to match the dates in the Hijri calendar with the dates of the Gregorian calendar established by Pope Gregory the 13th in 1582 CE. One can calculate the rough equivalence between the Islamic age and Gregorian Christian year C with the following formula. H into 32 divided by 33 plus 622 equal to C. The survival of a religion rests on the survival of the community of believers. The community has to be consolidated internally and protected from external dangers. Consolidation and protection require political institutions such as states and governments which are either inherited from the past, borrowed from outside or created from scratch. In Medina, Muhammad created a political order from all the three sources which gave his followers the protection they needed as well as resolved the city's ongoing civil strife. The Ummah was converted into a wider community to include polytheists and the Jews of Medina under the political leadership of Muhammad. Muhammad consolidated the fate of for his followers by adding and refining rituals such as fasting and ethical principles. The community survived on agriculture and trade as well as arms tax. In addition, the Muslims organized expeditionary raids on Meccan caravans and nearby oases. These raids provoked reactions from the Meccans and caused a breach with the Jews of Medina. After a series of battles, Mecca was conquered and Muhammad's repetition as a religious preacher and a political leader spread far and wide. Muhammad now insisted on conversion as the sole criterion for membership of the community. In the harsh conditions of the desert, the Arabs attached great value to strength and solidarity. Impressed by Muhammad's achievement, many tribes, mostly Bedouins, joined the community by converting to Islam. Muhammad's alliances began to spread until they embraced the whole of Arabia. Medina became the administrative capital of the emerging Islamic State, with Mecca as its religious center. The Kaaba was cleansed of idols as Muslims were required to face the shrine when offering prayers. In a short space of time, Muhammad was able to unite a large part of Arabia under a new faith, community and state. The early Islamic polity, however, remained a federation of Arab tribes and clans for a long time. The Caliphate, Expansion, Civil Wars and Sect Formation After Muhammad's death in 632, no one could legitimately claim to be the next prophet of Islam. As a result, his political authority was transferred to the Ummah with no established principle of succession. This created opportunities for innovations but also caused deep divisions among the Muslims. The biggest innovation was the creation of the institution of caliphate, in which the leader of the community, Amir al-Muminin, became the deputy khalifa of the Prophet. The first four caliphs, 632-61, to 61, justified their powers on the basis of their close association with the Prophet and continued his work under the general guidelines he had provided. The twin objectives of the caliphate were to retain control over the tribes constituting the Ummah and to raise resources for the state. Following Muhammad's death, many tribes broke away from the Islamic State. Some even raised their own prophets to establish communities modelled on the Ummah. The first caliph, Abu Bakr, suppressed their revolts by a series of campaigns. The second caliph, Umar, shaped the Ummah's policy of expansion of power. The Caliph knew that Ummah could not be maintained out of the modest income derived from trade and taxes. Realizing that the rich booty 
Ghanima could be obtained from expeditionary raids, the Caleb and his military commanders mustered their tribal strength to conquer lands belonging to Byzantine Empire in the west and the Sasanian lands belonging Sasanian lands empire in the east. At the height of their power, the Byzantine and Sasanian power empires ruled vast territories and commanded huge resources to pursue their political and commercial interests in Arabia. The Byzantine Empire promoted Christianity and the Sasanian Empire patronized Zoroastrianism, the ancient religion of Iran. On the eve of the Arab invasion, these two empires had declined in strength due to the religious conflict and revolts by the aristocracy. This made it easier for the Arabs to annex territories through wars and treaties. In three successful campaigns, the Arabs brought Syria, Iraq, Iran and Egypt under the control of Medina. Military, military strategy, religious fervor and the weakness of the opposition contributed to the success of the Arabs. Further campaigns were launched by the third caliph, Uthman, to extend the control of the Central Asia. Within a decade of the death of Muhammad, the, the Arab Islamic State controlled the vast territory between the Nile and the Oxus. These lands remained under Muslim rule to this day. In all the conquered provinces, the caliphs imposed a new administrative structure headed by governors and tribal chieftains. The central treasury obtained its revenue and from taxes paid by Muslims as well as its share of the booty and raids. The caliph's soldiers, mostly Bedouins, settled in camp cities at the edge of the desert such as Kufa and Basra to remain within reach of the natural habitat as well as the caliph's command. The ruling class and the soldiers received shares of the booty and monthly payments. The non-Muslim population retained their rights to property and religious practices on payment of taxes, Karaj and Jizya. Jews and Christians were declared protected subjects of the state and given a large measure of autonomy in the conduct of the communal affairs. Political expansion and unification did not come easily to the Arab tribesmen. With territorial expansion, the unity of the Ummah became threatened by conflicts over the distribution of resources and offices. The ruling class of the early Islamic State comprised almost entirely the Quraysh of Mecca. The third caliph, Uthman, also Quraysh, packed his administration in his, with his own men to secure greater control. This further intensified the Meccan character of the state and the conflict with the other tribesmen. Opposition in Iraq and Egypt, combined with the opposition in Medina, led to the assassination of Uthman. With Uthman's death, Ali became the fourth caliph. The rifts among the Muslims deepened after Ali, 656-61, to fought two wars against those who represented the Meccan aristocracy. Ali established himself at Kufa and defeated an army led by Muhammad's wife, Aisha, in the Battle of the Camel 657. He was, however, not able to suppress the faction led by Muawiyah, a kinsman of Uthman and the governor of Syria. Ali's second battle at Sifind, northern Mesopotamia, ended in a truce which split his followers into two groups. Some remained loyal to him, while others left the camp and came to be known as Karjis. Soon after, Ali was assassinated by a Karji in a mosque at Kufa. After his death, his followers paid allegiance to his son Hussein and his descendants Mawiya made himself the next caliph in 661, founding the Umayyad dynasty which lasted to 750. After the civil wars, it appeared as if Arab domination would disintegrate. There were also signs that the tribal conquerors were adopting the sophisticated culture of their subjects. It was under the Umayyads, a prosperous clan of the Quraysh tribe, that a second round of consolidation took place. The Umayyads and the centralization of polity. 
The conquest of large territories destroyed the caliphate based in Medina and replaced it with an increasingly authoritarian polity. The Umayyads implemented a series of political measures which consolidated their leadership with the Ummah. The first Umayyad caliph, Muawiyah, moved his capital to Damascus and adopted the court ceremonies and administrative institution of the Byzantine Empire. He also introduced hereditary accessions and persuaded the leading Muslims to accept his son as his heir. These innovations were adopted by the caliphs who followed him and allowed the Umayyads to retain power for 90 years and the Abbasids for two centuries. The Umayyad state was now an imperial power no longer based directly on Islam but on statecraft and the loyalty of Syrian troops. There were Christian advisers in the administration as well as Zoroastrian scribes and bureaucrats. However, Islam continued to provide legitimacy to their rule. The Umayyads always appealed for unity and suppressed rebellions in the name of Islam. They also retained their Arab social identity. During the reign of Abd al-Malik, 685 to 705, and his successors, both the Arab and Islamic identities were strongly emphasized. Among the measures Abd al-Malik took were the adoption of Arabic as the language of administration and the introduction of an Islamic coinage. The gold dinar and silver dirham that had been circulating in the caliphate were copies of Byzantine and Iranian coins, denarius and drachm, with symbols of crosses and fire altars and Greek and Pahlavi, the, the language of Iran, inscriptions. These symbols were removed and the coins now carried Arabic inscriptions. Abd al-Malik also made a highly visible contribution to the development of an Arab Islamic identity by building the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. Abd al-Malik coinage reform. The three coin specimens show the transition from Byzantine to Arab Islamic coinage. On the second coin, the bearded and long haired caliph is dressed in traditional Arab robes and is holding a sword. It is the first extant portrait of a Muslim. It is also unique because later there developed an antipathy towards the representation of living beings in art and craft. Abd al-Malik reform of coinage was linked with his reorganization of state finances. It proved so successful that for hundreds of years, coins were struck according to the pattern and weight of the third specimen. The Abbasid revolution for the success in centralizing the Muslim polity, the Umayyads paid a heavy price. A well-organized movement called Dawa brought down the Umayyads and replaced them with another family of Meccan origin, the Abbasis in 750. The Abbasids portrayed the Umayyad regime as evil and promised a restoration of the original Islam of the Prophet. The revolution led not only to a change of dynasty, but changes in the political structure and culture of Islam. The Abbasid uprising broke out in the distant region of Khurasan, a 20-day journey from Damascus on a fast horse. Khurasan had a mixed Arab-Iranian population which could be mobilized for various reasons. The Arab soldiers here were mostly from Iraq and resented the dominance of the Syrians. The civilians, Arabs of Khurasan, disliked the Umayyad regime for having made promises of tax concessions and privileges which were never fulfilled. As for the Iranian Muslims, they were exposed to the scorn of the race-conscious Arabs and were eager to join any campaign to oust the Umayyads. The Abbasids, descendants of Abbas, the Prophet's uncle, mustered the support of the various dissident groups and legitimized their bid for power by promising that a messiah from the family of the Prophet, Al al Bayat, would liberate them from the oppressive Umayyad regime. Their army was led by an Iranian slave, Abu Muslim, who defeated the last Umayyad caliph, Marwan, in a battle at the river Zab. Under Abbasid rule, Arab influence declined, while the importance of Iranian culture decree increased. The Abbasids established their capital at Baghdad, 
near the ruins of the ancient Iranian pentropolis. Tesiphon. The army and the bureaucracy were reorganized on a non-tribal basis to ensure greater participation by Iraq and Khorasan. The Abbasid rulers strengthened the religious status and functions of the caliphate and patronized Islamic institutions and scholars, but they were forced by the needs of government and empire to retain the centralized nature of the state. They maintained the magnificent imperial architecture and elaborate court ceremonials of the Umayyads. The regime which took pride in having brought down the monarchy found itself compelled to establish it again. Breakup of the Caliphate and the Rise of Sultanates The Abbasid state became weaker from the 9th century because the Baghdad's control over the distant provinces declined and because of conflict between pro-Arab and pro-Iranian factions in the army and bureaucracy. In 810, a civil war broke out between supporters of Amin and Mamun, sons of the Caliph Harun al-Rashid, which deepened the factionalism and created a new power block of Turkish slave officers, Mamluk. Shizm once again competed with Sunni orthodoxy for power. A number of minor dynasties arose, such as Tahrids and Samanids in Khurasan and Transoxiana, to run off lands beyond the Oxus and the Tulunids in Egypt and Syria. Abbasid power was soon limited to central Iraq and Western Iran. That too was lost in 945 when the Bayats, a Shayat clan and the, from the Caspian region of Iran captured Baghdad. The Bayat rulers assumed various titles, including the ancient Iranian title Shahanshah, King of Kings, but not that of Caliph. They kept the Abbasid Caliph as the symbolic head of their Sunni subjects. The decision not to abolish the caliphate was a shrewd one, because another Shayat dynasty, the Fatimids, had ambitions to rule the Islamic world. The Fatimids belonged to the Islamic subsect of Shiism and claimed to be descended from the Prophet's daughter Fatima and hence the sole rightful rulers of Islam. From their base in North Africa, they conquered Egypt in 969 and established the Fatimid Caliphate. The old capital of Egypt, Fustat, was replaced by a new city, Kahira, Cairo, founded on the day of the rise of the planet Mars, Mirik, also called al kahir The two rival dynasties patronized Shayat administrators, poets and scholars. Between 950 and 1200, Islamic society was held together not by a single political order or a single language of culture, but by common economic and cultural patterns. Unity in the face of political divisions was maintained by the separation between state and society. The development of Persian as a language of Islamic high culture and the maturity of the dialogue between intellectual traditions Scholars, artists and merchants moved freely within the central Islamic lands and assured the circulation of ideas and manners. Some of these also percolated down to the level of villages due to conversion. The Muslim percolated down to the level of villages. The Muslim population, less than 10% of the Umayyad and early Abbasid periods increased enormously. The identity of Islam as a religion and periods increased enormously. The identity of Islam as a religion and a cultural system separate from other religions became much sharper, which made conversion possible and meaningful. A third ethnic group was added to the Arabs and Iranians with the rise of the Turkish Sultanates in the 10th and 11th centuries. The Turks were nomadic tribes from the Central Asian steppes, grasslands of Turkestan northeast of the Aral Sea to the borders of China, who gradually converted to Islam. They were skilled riders and warriors and entered the Abbasid, Samanid and Buyid administrations as slaves and soldiers, rising to high positions on account of their loyalty and military abilities. The Ghaznavid Sultanate was established by Al-Tikind, 
961 and consolidated by Mahmud of Ghazni. Like the Buyids, the Ghaz- Ghaznavids were a military dynasty like a professional army of Turks and Indians. One of the generals of Mahmud was an Indian named Tilak. But their center of power was in Khorasan and Afghanistan and for them the Abbasid Caliphs were not rivals but a source of legitimacy. Mahmud was conscious of being the son of a slave and was specially eager to receive the title of Sultan from the Caliph. The Caliph was willing to support the Sunni Ghaznavid as a counterweight to Shahid power. The Seljuk Turks entered Turand as soldiers in the armies of Samanids and Karakhanids. They later established themselves as a powerful group under the leadership of two brothers, Tukril and Chakri Beg, taking advantage, conquered, taking advantage of the chaos following the death of Mahmud of Ghazni. The Saljuks conquered Khorasan in 137 and made Nishapur their first capital. The Saljuks next turned their attention to Western Persia and Iraq, ruled by the Buyids and in 19 and in 155 restored Baghdad to Sunni rule the caliph al qayyim conferred on tukril beg the title of sultan in a move that marked the separation of religious and political authority the two saljuk brothers ruled together in accordance with the tribal notion of rule by the family as a whole tukril was succeeded by his nephew alp arsalan during Alp al saran reign, the Seljuk Empire expanded to Anatolia, modern Turkey. From the 11th to the 13th century, there was a series of conflicts between European Christians and the Arab states. This is discussed below. Then at the start of the 13th century, the Muslim world found itself on the verge of the great disaster. This was the threat from the Mongols, the last but most decisive of all nomadic assaults on settled civilizations. The Crusades In medieval Islamic societies, Christians were regarded as the people of the book, al al Kitab, Since they had their own scripture, the New Testament or Injil, Christians were granted safe conduct a month while venturing into Muslim states as merchants, pilgrims, ambassadors and travelers. These territories also included those which were once held by Byzantine Empire, notably the Holy Land of Palestine. Jerusalem was conquered by the Arabs in 638, but it was ever present in the Christian imagination as the place of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. This was an important factor in the formation of the image of Muslims in the Christian Europe. Hostility towards the Muslim world became more pronounced in the 11th century. Normans, Hungarians and some slaves, Slavs, had been converted to Christianity and the Muslim alone remained as the main enemy. There was also a change in the social and economic organization of Western Europe in the 11th century, which contributed to the hostility between Christendom and the Islamic world. The clergy and the warrior class the first two orders were making efforts to ensure political stability as well as economic growth based on agriculture and trade. The possibilities of military confrontation between competing feudal principalities and a return to economic organization based on plunder were contained by the Peace of God movement. All military violence was forbidden inside certain areas near places of worship during certain periods considered sacred in the church calendar and against certain vulnerable social groups such as churchmen and the common people. The peace of God deflected the aggressive tendencies of feudal society away from the Christian world and towards the enemies of God. It built a climate in which fighting against the infidels, non-believers became not only permissible but also commendable. The dead end 192 of Malik Shah, the Saljuk Sultan of Baghdad, was followed by the disintegration of his empire. This imp- offered the Byzantine Emperor Alexius I a chance to regain Asia Minor and northern Syria. For Pope Urban II, this was an opportunity to revive the spirit of Christianity.
In 195, the Pope joined the Byzantine Emperor in calling for a war in the name of God to liberate the Holy Land. Between 1095 and 1291, Western European Christians planned and fought wars against Muslim cities on the coastal plains of the eastern Mediterranean Levant. These wars were later designated as Crusades. In the First Crusade, 1098-99, soldiers from France and Italy captured Antioch in Syria and claimed Jerusalem. Their victory was accompanied by the slaughter of Muslims and Jews in the city chronicled by both Christians and Muslims. Muslim writers referred to the arrival of Christians called Infringi or Firangi as a Frankish invasion. The Franks quickly established four crusader states in the region of Syria-Palestine. Collectively, these territories were known as Outrema, the land overseas, and later crusades were directed at its defence and expansion. The Outrema survived well for some time, but when the Turks captured Edessa, an appeal was made by the Pope for a second crusade. 1145-49 to A combined German and French army made an attempt to capture Damascus, but they were defeated and forced to return home. After this, there was a gradual erosion of the strength of Outrema. Crusader zeal gave way to living in luxury and to battles over territory among the Christian rulers. Salah al hadin created an Egypto-Syrian empire and gave the call for jihad or holy war against the Christians and defeated them in 1187. He regained Jerusalem nearly a century after the First Crusade. Records of the time indicate that Salah al hadins treatment of the Christian population was humane, in marked contrast to the way in which Christians had earlier dealt with Muslims and Jews. Although he gave custody of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre to the Christians, a number of churches were turned into mosques and Jerusalem once again became a Muslim city. The loss of the city prompted a third crusade in 1189, but the crusaders gained little except for some coastal towns in Palestine and free access to Jerusalem for Christian pilgrims. The Mamluks, the rulers of Egypt, finally drove the crusading Christians from all of Palestine in 1291. Europe gradually lost military interest in Islam and focus on its internal political and cultural development. The Crusades left a lasting impact on two aspects of Christian-Muslim relations. One was the harsher attitude of the Muslim state towards its Christian subjects which resulted from the bitter memories of the conflict as well as the needs for security in areas of mixed populations. The other was the greater influence of Italian mercantile communities from Pisa, Genoa and Venice in the trade between the East and the West even after the restoration of Muslim power. Franks in Syria The treatment of the subjugated Muslim population differed among the various Frankish lords. The earliest of the Crusaders who settled down in Syria and Palestine were generally more tolerant of the Muslim population than those who came later. In his memoirs, Usama in M- Munkeith, a 12th century Syrian Muslim, has something interesting to say about his new neighbours. Among the Franks, there are some who have settled down in his country and associated with Muslims. They are better than the newcomers, but they are exceptions to the rule and no inference can be drawn from them. Here is an example. Once I sent a man to Antioch on business. At that time, Chief Theodore Sofianos, an Eastern Christian, was there and he and I were friends. He was then all-powerful in Antioch. One day he said to my man, One of my Frankish friends has invited me. Come with me and see how they live. My man told me. So I went with him and we came to the house of want of the old knights. Those who had come with the first Frankish expedition he had already retired from state and military service and had a property in Antioch from which he lived. 
He produced a fine table with food both tasty and cleanly served. He saw that I was reluctant to eat and said, Eat to your heart's content, for I do not eat Frankish food. I have Egypt, Egyptian women cooks and eats nothing but what they prepare, nor does swine flesh ever enter my house. So I ate, but with some caution, and we took our leave. Later I was walking through the market when suddenly a Frankish woman got hold of me and began jabbering in their language, and I could not understand what she was saying. A crowd of Franks collected against me, and I was sure that my end had come. Then suddenly that same night appeared, and saw me, and came up to that woman and asked her, What do you want of this Muslim? she replied. He killed my brother Hurso. This Hurso was a knight of Afimia, who had been killed by someone from the army of Hama. Then the knight shouted at her and said, This man is Burjasi, Burjoris, that is, a merchant. He does not fight nor go to war. And he shouted to the crowd, and they dispersed. And then he took my hand and went away. So the effect of that meal that I had was to save me from that. Economy, agriculture, urbanization and commerce. Agriculture was the principal occupation of the settled populations in the newly conquered territories. The Islamic State made no changes in this. Land was owned by big and small peasants and in some cases by the state. In Iraq and Iran, land existed in fairly large units cultivated by peasants. The state owners collected taxes on behalf of the state during the Sasanian as well as Islamic periods. In areas that had moved from a pastoral to a settled agricultural system, land was the common property of the village. Finally, big estates that were abandoned by their owners after the Islamic conquest were acquired by the state and handed over mainly to the Muslim elites of the empire, particularly members of the caliph's family. The state had overall control of agricultural lands, deriving the bulk of its income from land revenue once the conquests were over. The lands conquered by the Arabs that remained in the hands of the owners were subject to attacks, Karaj, which varied from half to a fifth of the produce according to the conditions of cultivation. On land held or cultivated by Muslims, the tax levied was one-tenth of the produce. When non-Muslims started to convert to Islam to pay lower taxes, this reduced the income of the state. To address the shortfall, the caliphs first discouraged conversions and later adopted a uniform policy of taxation. From the 10th century onwards, the state authorized its officials to claim their salaries from the agricultural revenues from territories called ictas, Revenue Assignments Agricultural prosperity went hand-in-hand hand with political stability. In many areas, especially in the Nile River Valley, the state supported irrigation systems, the construction of dams and canals, and the digging of wells, all of which were crucial for good harvest. Islamic, gave, Islamic law gave tax concessions to people who brought land under cultivation. Do peasant initiatives and state support cultivatable land expanded and productivity rose. Even in the absence of major technological changes, many new crops such as cotton, oranges, bananas, watermelons, spinach and brinjols were grown and even exported to Europe. Islamic civilization flourished as the number of cities grew phenomenally. Many new cities were founded mainly to settle Arab soldiers who formed the backbone of the local administration. Among this class of Grecian cities called Misir were Kufa and Basra in Iraq and Fustat and Cairo in Egypt. Within half a century of its establishment as the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate, the population of Baghdad had reached around 1 million. Alongside these cities were older towns such as Damascus, Isfahan and Samarkand which receive a new lease of life. Their size and population surge, supported by an expansion in the production of food grains and raw materials such as cotton and sugar for urban manufacturers. A vast urban network developed 
linking one town with another and forming a circuit. At the heart of the city were two buildings, complexes radiating cultural and economic power. The Congregational Mosque, big enough to be seen from a distance, and the central marketplace with shops in a row, merchants' lodgings, and the office of the money changer. The cities were homes to administrators and scholars and merchants who lived close to the, to the centre. Ordinary c- citizens and soldiers had their living quarters in the outer circle, each fitted with its own mosque, church or synagogue, subsidiary market and public path, an important meeting place. At the outskirts were the houses of the urban poor, a market for green vegetables and fruits brought from the countryside, caravan stations and unclean shops such as those dealing in tannin or butchering. Beyond the city walls were inns for people to rest when the city gates were shut and cemeteries. There were variations on this topology depending on the nature of the landscape, political traditions and historical events. Political unification and the urban demand for foodstuff and luxuries enlarged the circuit of exchange. Geography favoured the Muslim empire, which spread between the trading zones of the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean. For five centuries, Arab and Iranian traders monopolised the maritime trade between China, India and Europe. This trade passed through two major routes, namely the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. High-value goods suitable for long-distance trade such as spices, textile, porcelain and gunpowder were shipped from India and China to the Red Sea ports of Aden and Adyab and the Gulf ports of Siraf and Basra. From here, the merchandise were carried overland in camel's caravans to the warehouses. Magazine, origin of the word magazine, which has a similar connection of articles of Baghdad, Damascus and Aleppo for lo- local consumption or onward transmission. The caravans passing through Mecca got bigger whenever the Hajj coincided with the sailing seasons. Mawasim, origin of the word monsoon in the Indian Ocean. At the Mediterranean end of these trade routes, exports to Europe and the port of Alexandria were handled by Jewish merchants, some of whom traded directly with India, as can be seen from the letters preserved at the Geniza collection. However, from the 10th century, the Red Sea route gained greater importance due to the rise of Cairo as a center of commerce and power and growing demand for eastern goods and the trading cities of Italy. Towards the eastern end, caravans and Iranian merchants set out from Baghdad along the Silk Route to China via the oasis cities of Bukhara and Samarkand, Transoxiana, to bring Central Asian and Chinese goods, including paper, Transoxiana, also formed an important link in the commercial network which extended north to Russia and Scandinavia for the exchange of European goods and Slavic captives. Islamic coins used for the payment of these goods were found in hordes discovered along the Volga River and in the Baltic region. Male and female Turkish slaves too were purchased in these markets for the courts of the caliphate and sultans. The fiscal system, income and expenditure of the state and the market exchange increased the importance of money in the central Islamic lands. Coins of gold, silver and copper were minted and circulated, often in bags, sealed by money. Changes to pay for goods and services, gold came from Africa and silver from Central Asia. Precious metals and coins also came from Europe, which used these to pay for its trade with the East. Rising demand, rising demand for money forced people to release their accumulated reserves and idle wealth into circulation. Credit combined with currencies to oil the wheels of commerce. The greatest com- contribution of the Muslim world to medieval co- economic life was the development of superior methods of payment and business organization. Letters of credit, sak, origin of the word check, and bills of exchange, suftaja, were used by merchants and bankers to transfer money from one place 
or an individual to another. The widespread use of commercial papers freed merchants from the need to carry cash everywhere and also made their journeys safer. The Caleb too used the sulk to pay salaries or reward poets and minstrels. Although it was customary for merchants to set up family businesses or employ slaves to run their affairs, formal businesses, arrangements, muzarba, were also common in which sleeping partners entrusted capital to travelling merchants and shared profits and losses in an agreed proportion. Islam did not stop people from making money so long as certain prohibitions were respected. For instance, interest-bearing transaction riba were unlawful although people circumvented usury in ingenious ways heyal such as borrowing money in one type of coin and paying in another while disguising the interest as a commission on currency exchange the origin of the bill of exchange many tales from thousands and one nights of laila why laila give us a picture of medieval islamic society featuring characters such as sailors slaves merchants and money changers paper geniza records and history in the central islamic lands written works were widely circulated after the introduction of paper paper made from linen came from china where the manufacturing process was a closely guarded secret in 751 the muslim governor of samarkand took 20000 chinese invaders as prisoners some of whom were good at making paper for the next 100 years samarkand paper remained an important export item since islam prohibited monopolies paper began to be manufactured in the rest of islamic world by the middle of the 10th century it had more or less replaced papyrus the writing material made from the inner stem of a plant that grew freely in the nile valley demand for paper increased and abd al latif a doctor from baghdad see his depiction of the ideal student on page 98 and a resident of egypt between 1193 and 1207 reported how egyptian peasants robbed graves to obtain mummy wrappings made of linen to sell to paper factories paper also facilitated the writing of commercial and personal documents of all kinds in 1896 a huge collection of medieval jewish documents was discovered in a sealed room geniza pron- pronounced geniza of the ben ezra zinakok in fustat the documents had been preserved thanks to the jewish practice of not destroying any piece of writing that contained the name of god the geniza was found to contain over a quarter of a million manuscripts and fragments dating back as far as the mid 8th century most of the material dated from the 10th to the 13th centuries that is from the fatimid ayyubid and the early mamluk periods these included personal letters between merchants family and friends contracts promises of dowry sale documents laundry lists and other trivia Most of the documents were written in Judeo Arabic, a version of the Arabic written in Hebrew, practice that was commonly used by Jewish communities throughout the medieval Mediterranean. The, Gen- the Geniza documents provide rich insights into personal and economic experiences as also into Mediterranean and Islamic culture. The documents also suggest that the business skills and commercial techniques of merchants of the medieval islamic world were more advanced than those of their european counterparts goitain wrote a multi-volume history of mediterranean and geniza records and amitav ghosh was inspired by a geniza letter letter to tell the story of an indian slave in his book in an antique land learning and culture as the religious and social experiences of the muslims steepened through contact with other people the community was obliged to reflect on itself and confront issues pertaining to god and the world what should be the ideal conduct of a muslim in public and private what is the object of creation and how does one know that go- what god wants from his creatures how can one understand the mysteries of the universe 
Answers to such questions came from learned Muslims who acquired and organized knowledge of different kinds of to strengthen the social identity of the community as well as to satisfy the intellectual curiosity. For religious scholars, ulama, knowledge, ilm, derived from the Quran and the model behavior of the Prophet Sana was the only way to know the will of God and provide guidance in this world. The ulama in medieval times devoted themselves to writing tafsir and documenting Muhammad's authentic hadith. Some went on to prepare a body of laws or sharia, the straight part, straight part to govern the relationship of Muslims with God through rituals, ibadat, and with the rest of the humanity through social affairs, Mu'amalat. In framing Islamic law, jurists also made use of reasoning qiyas, since not everything was apparent in the Quran or Hadith, and life had become increasingly complex with urbanization. Differences in the interpretation of the sources and methods of jurisprudence led to the formation of four schools of law in the 8th and 9th centuries. These were the Maliki, Hanafi, Shafili, and Hanbali schools, each named after a leading jurist, the last being the most conservative. The Sharia provided guidance on all possible legal issues within Sunni society, though it was more precise on questions on personal status, marriage, divorce, and inheritance than on commercial matters or penal and constitutional issues. Before it took its final form, the Sharia was adjusted to take into account the customary laws of the various regions as well as the laws of the state on political and social order. Customary laws, however, retained their strength in large parts of the countryside and continued to bypass the Sharia in matters such as inheritance of land by daughters. In most regimes, the ruler of the officials dealt routinely with matters of state security and sent only selected cases to the Qazi judge. The Qazi appointed by the state in each city or locality often acted as an arbitrator in disputes rather than as a strict enforcer or the Sharia. A group of religious-minded people in medieval Islam known as so he sought a deeper and more personal knowledge of God through asceticism and mysticism. The more society gave itself to material pursuits and pleasures, the more the Sufis sought to re renounce the world and rely on God alone. In the 8th and 9th centuries, ascetic inclinations were elevated to the highest stage of mysticism by the ideas of pantheism and love. Pantheism is the idea of oneness, of the human soul must be united with its maker. Unity with God can be achieved through an intense love for God, which the woman saint Rabia of Basra preached in her poems. Bayezid Bistami, an Iranian Sufi, was the first to teach the importance of submerging the self, Fana in God. Sufis used Muslim mus musical concerts to induce ecstasy, and stimulate emotions of love and passion. Sufism is open to all regardless of religious affiliations, status and gender. Dhulnan Misri, whose grave can still be seen near the pyramids in Egypt, declared before the Abbasid Caliph al Mutawakkal that he learned true Islam from an old woman and true chivalry from a water carrier. By making religion more personal and less institutional, Sufism gained popularity and posed a challenge to Orthodox Islam. An alternative vision of God and the universe was developed by Islamic philosophers and scientists under the influence of Greek philosophy and science. During the 7th century, remnants of the late Greek culture could still be found in the Byzantine and Sasanian empires although they were slowly dying. In the schools of Alexandria, Syria and Mesopotamia, once part of Alexander's empire, Greek philosophy, mathem mathematics and medicine were taught along with other subjects. The Umayyad and Abbasid caliphs commissioned the translations of Greek and Syriac books into Arabic by Christian scholars.
Translation became a well-organized activity under Al-Mamun, who supported the library Kam Institute of Science, Bait al-Hikmah, in Baghdad with the scholar's work. The works of Aristotle, the elements of Euclid, and Ptolemy al-Najas were brought to the attention of Arabic reading scholars. Indian works on astronomy, mathematics, and medicine were also translated into Arabic during the same period. These works reached Europe and kindled interest in philosophy and science. The study of new subjects promoted critical inquiry and had a profound influence on Islamic intellectual life. Scholars with a theological bent of mind, such as the group known as Mutazila, used Greek logic and the methods of reasoning to defend Islamic beliefs. Philosophers, Fala Sifa, posed wider questions and provided fresh answers. Ibn Sina, 19, 980 to 1037, a doctor by profession and a philosopher, did not believe in the resurrection of the body on the Day of Judgment. This was met with strong opposition from the theologians. His medical writings were widely read. The most influential was al Kanun Filjib, Canon of Medicine, a million word manuscript that lists 760 drugs sold by pharmacists of his day and includes notes of his own experiments conducted in hospital Bimaristan. The canon points out the importance of dietetics healing through dietary regulation, the influence of the climate and environment on health, and the contagious nature of some diseases. The canon was used as a textbook in Europe, where the author was known as Avicenna. Just before his death, the scientist and poet Umar Khayyam was said to be reading the canon. His gold toothpick was found between two pages of the chapter on metaphysics. In medieval Islamic societies, fine language and a creative imagination were among the most appreciated qualities in a person. These qualities raised a person's communication to the level of adab, a term which implied literary and cultural refinement. Adab forms of expression included poetry and prose, which were meant to be memorized and used when the occasion arose. The most popular poetic composition of pre-Islamic origin was the Ode, Qasida, developed by the poets of Abbasid period to glorify the achievement of their patrons. Poets of the Abbasid period to glorify... Poets of Persian origin revitalized and reinvented Arabic poetry and challenged the cultural hegemony of the Arabs. Abu Nawaz who was of Persian origin, broke new ground by composing classical poetry on new themes such as wine and male love with the intention of celebrating pleasures forbidden by Islam. After Abu Nuwaj, the poets addressed the object of their passion in the masculine, even if the latter was a woman. Following the same tradition, the Sufis glorified the intoxication caused by the wine of mystical love. By the time the Arabs conquered Iran, Pallavi, and the language of the sacred books of ancient Iran was in decay. A version of Pal- Pahlavi, known as New Persian, with a huge Arabic vocabulary, soon developed. The formation of sultanates in Khurasan and Transoxiana took New Persian to great cultural heights. The Samanid court, poet Rudaki, was considered the father of New Persian poetry, which included new forms, such as the short lyrical poem and the Qutran, Rubai, plural Rubaiyat. The Rubai is a four-line stanza in which the first two lines set the stage, the third is finely poised, and the fourth delivers the point. In contrast to its form, the subject matter of the Rubai is unrestricted. It can be used to express the beauty of a beloved praise a patron or express the thoughts of the philosopher. The Rubai reached its zenith in the hands of Umar Khayyam, also an astronomer and mathematician who lived at various times in Bukhara, Samarkand and Isfahan. At the beginning of the 11th century, Ghazni became the centre of Persian literary life. 
Poets were naturally attracted to the brilliance of the imperial court. Rulers, too, realized the importance of patronizing arts and learning for enhancing their prestige. Mahmud of Ghazni gathered around him a group of poets who composed anthologies, diwans, and epic poetry, Matnavi. The most outstanding was Firdosi, who took 30 years to complete the Shanama Book of Kings, an epic of 50,000 couplets which has become a masterpiece of Islamic literature. The Shanama is a collection of traditions and legends, the most popular being that of Rustam, which poetically disp- depicts Iran from creation up until the Arab conquest. It was in keeping with the Ghaznavid tradition that the Persian later became the language of administration and culture in India. The catalogue, Kitab al Fihrist of a Baghdad bookseller, Ibn Nadim, describes a large number of works written in prose for the moral education and amusement of readers. The oldest of these is a collection of animal fables called Kalila wa Nimda, the names of the two jackals who were the leading characters, which is the Arabic translation of a Pahlavi version of the Panchantra. The most widespread and lasting literary works are the stories of hero adventures, such as Alexander, Al Iskander, and Sinbad, or those of ha- unhappy lovers, such as Kuis, known as Majnu, or the Madman. These have developed over the centuries into oral and written traditions. The Thousands and One Nights is another collection of stories told by a single narrator. Shahra. Shah Razad to her husband night after night. The collection was originally in Indo-Persian and was translated into Arabic in Baghdad in the 8th century. More stories were later added in Cairo during the Mamluk period. These stories depict human beings of different types, the generous, the stupid, the gullible, the crafty, and were told to educate and entertain. In his kitab, al Bukhala. Jazid of Basra collected amusing anecdotes about misers and also analyzed Greed. From the 9th century onwards, the scope of Adab was expanded to include biographies, manual of ethics, mirrors of princes, and above all, history and geography. The tradition of history writing was well established in literate Muslim societies. History books were, were read by scholars and students as well as by broader literate public. For rulers and officials, history provided a good record for the glories and achievements of a dynasty as well as examples of the techniques of administration. In the two major his- historical historical works, Ansab al Ashraf, Genealogies of the Nobles, and Bala Duri, date eight hundred and ninety five, and Tariq al Rusul Wa Muluk, History of Prophets and Kings of the Bari, the whole human history was treated with the Islamic period as the focal point. The tradition of local history writing developed with the breakup of the Caliphate. Books were written in Persian about dynasties, cities or regions to explore the unity and variety of the world of Islam. Geography and travel, Rila, constituted a special branch of Adab. These combined knowledge from Greek, Iranian and Indian books with the observation of merchants and travellers. In mathematical geography, the inhabited world was divided into seven climes, singular Ilkim, parallel with the equator, corresponding to our three continents. The exact position of each city was determined astronomically. The exact position of each city was determined astronomically. Mukadasi, descriptive geography, Asan al Takasim, the best divisions, is a comparative study of the countries and peoples of the world and a treasure trove of exotic curiosities. Geography and general history were combined in Muraj al Dahabab, Golden Meadows of Masudi, written in 943, to illustrate the wide variety of worldly cultures. Al-Biruni's famous Tahkik Ma Lil Hind, History of India, was the greatest attempt by an 11th century Muslim writer 
to look beyond the world of Islam and observe what was of value in another cultural tradition. By the 10th century, an Islamic world had emerged which was easily recognizable by travelers. Religious buildings was, were the greatest external symbols of the world. Mosques, shrines and tombs from Spain to Central Asia showed the same basic design, arches, domes, minarets and open courtyards and expressed the spiritual and practical needs of Muslims. In the first Islamic century, the mosque acquired a distinct architectural form, roof supported by pillars, which transcended regional variations. The mosque had had an open courtyard where a mount where a fountain was placed leading to a vaulted hall which could accommodate long lines of worshippers and prayer leader, leader imam. Two special features were located inside the hall, a niche mihrab in the wall indicating a direction of Mecca and a pulpit minbar pronounced mimbar. From where the sermons were developed, delivered during noon prayers on Friday, Attached to the building was the minaret, a tower used to call the faithful to prayer at the appointed times and to symbolize the presence of the new faith. Time was marked in cities and villages by the five daily prayers and weekly sermons. The same pattern of construction of buildings built around a central courtyard appeared not only in mosques and mausoleums but also in caravanserais, hospitals and palaces. The Umayyads built desert places in oases such as Kirbat, al mustar in Palestine and Kursair, Amra in Jordan, which served as luxurious residences and retreats for hunting and pleasure. The palaces modelled on Roman and Sasanian architecture were lavishly decorated with sculptures, mosaics and paintings of people. The Abbasids built a new imperial city in Samara and Mitz gardens and running waters, which is mentioned in the stories and legends revolving round Harun al-Rashid, the great palaces of the Abbasid Caliphs in Baghdad, or the Fatimids in Cairo have disappeared, leaving only traces in literary texts. The rejection of representing living beings in the religious art of Islam promoted two art forms, calligraphy, khatati, or the art of beautiful writing, and arabesque, geometric and vegetal right designs. Small and big inscriptions, usually on religious quotations, were used to decorate architecture. Calligraphic art had been best preserved in manuscripts of the Quran dating from the 8th and 9th centuries. Literary works such as Kitab al-Afghani, Book of Songs, Kalila wa Dibna, and Makamat of Hariri were illustrated from miniature paintings in addition, to a wide variety of illumination techniques were introduced and enhanced the beauty of a book, plant and floral designs based on the idea of the garden, were used in buildings and book illustrations. The history of the central Islamic lands brings together three important aspects of human civilization, religion, community and politics. We can see them as three circles which merge and appear as one in the 7th century. In the next five centuries, the circle separate. Towards the end of the period, the influence of Islam over state and government was minimal. The politics involved many things which had no sanction in the religion. The circles of religion and community overlapped. The, the Muslim community was united in its observance of Sharia and rituals, and personal matters. It was no more governing itself, but it was defining its religious identity. The only way the circles of religion and community could have separated was through the progressive secularization of Muslim society. Philosophers and Sufis advocated this, suggesting that civil society should be made autonomous and rituals must be replaced by private spirituality. The Quran and if all the trees on earth were pens and oceans were ink, with seven oceans behind it to add its supply, yet would not the words of Allah be exhausted in the writing?
The Quran is a book in Arabic divided into 114 chapters, surahs, and arranged in descending order of length, the shortest being the last. The only exception to this is the first surah, which is a short prayer, al fatiha or opening. According to Muslim tradition, the Quran is a collection of messages, revelations which God sent to the Prophet Muhammad between 610 and 632, first in Mecca and then in Medina. The task of compiling these revelations were completed sometime in 650. The oldest complete Quran we have today dates back to 9th century. There are many fragments which are older, the earliest being the verses engraved on the Dome of the Rock and on coins in the 7th century. The use of the Quran as a source material of, for the history of early Islam has posed some problems. The first is that it is a scripture, a text vested with religious authority. Theologians generally believe that as a speech of God, it has to be understood literally, but rationalists among them give wider interpretations to the Quran. In 833, the Abbasid Caliph al mamun imposed of the view in a trial of faith of Mina that the Quran is God's creation rather than his speech. The second problem is that Quran very often speaks in metaphors and unlike the Old Testament, it does not narrate events but only refers to them. Medieval Islamic scholars thus had to make sense of many verses with the help of hadith. Many hadith were written to help the reading of the Quran. The ideal student, Abd al Latif, a 12th century legal and medical scholar of Baghdad, talks to his ideal student. I commend you not to learn your sciences from books unaided, even though you may trust your ability to understand. Resort to teachers for each science you seek to acquire, and should your teacher be limited in his knowledge, take all that he can offer until you find another more accomplished than he. You must until you find another more accomplished. You must venerate and respect him. When you read a book, make every effort to learn it by heart and master its meaning. Imagined, imagined the book to have disappeared and that you, ha you can dispense with it unaffected by its loss. One should read history, study biographies and the experiences of nations. By doing this, it will be as though in his short life space he lived contempt contemporaneously with peoples of the past, was under intimate terms with them, and knew the good and bad among them. You should model your conduct on the early of Muslims. Therefore, read the biography of the Prophet and follow on his footsteps. You should frequently distrust your nature rather than have a good opinion on it, submitting your thoughts to men of learning and their works, proceeding with caution and avoiding haste, he who has not endured the, f the stress of study will not taste the joy of knowledge. When you have finished your study and reflection, occupy your tongue with the mention of God's name and sing his praises. Do not complain if the world turns its back on you. Know that the learning leaves, that learning leaves a trail and a scent proclaiming its possessor, a ray of light and brightness shining on him, pointing him out. Ahmad ibn al Qasim ibn Abi Usabiyah Uyun al Anbah.